I am Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to the first chapter of Schultz and Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about the study of the history of psychology, and specifically why we should study it, putting history in context and schools of thought. But let's get started with the invisible gorilla. And this is actually two different studies. In one, a clown walks around campus, which depending on where your campus is, might not be that unusual. And the researchers found that 70% of people walking with another person saw the clown, but only 25% of people who were on phones saw the clown. You may also be familiar with the invisible gorilla study, which is something of an internet phenomena, where you're supposed to count the number of times in a video the white team passes the ball, and then a gorilla just walks into the middle of it, starts beating his chest, and uh, walks away. And 50% of people don't see the gorilla. Now this phenomena is called inattentional blindness, and it was actually discovered by Wundt in 1861. He did a multitasking experiment with an uh, apparatus that he invented and called a Gedankenmesser, but we will talk about that more in chapter four. What about the prehistory of psychology? Well, Ebbinghaus, uh, who's a famous psychologist, once said that psychology has a long past but a short history. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, that's the prehistory of psychology. Now, you are not alone. Don't worry, I'm not gonna sing. That's a song. Uh, I won't sing right now, maybe later. In this, You're not alone, though, in the study of psychology. The vast majority of colleges offer a history and systems course, so between 80 and 90% of schools, uh, and that's really unique to psychology, if, uh, to the major of psychology. If you're a chemistry major, you don't take a history of chemistry class, but um, psychology can be traced back to the ancient Greeks, or at least people try to. So people like Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, they were interested in topics like memory, learning, motivation, perception, and abnormal behavior. Then along came the philosophers of the 19th century who speculated about their own experiences, and they begin to use methods and tools from other sciences, and that's when things really start to change and accelerate. But a good question is, is psychology a science? Now, William James, who we'll meet later also, he said that psychology is not a science, but only the hope of a science. And he was saying that 100 years ago. 70% of the general public would seem to agree with that, that psychology may not be a science. One of the things we have to ask is what really happened? And this is one of the ideas of uh, historiography, which is the techniques and principles used in historical research. Now, scientists are at a real advantage because we can reconstruct or replicate the findings of scientists from other times and places, but the data of history doesn't work that way. The data of history is really very fragmentary. So sometimes we have letters, diaries, photos, books, that sort of thing, but it's impossible to recreate other times and places in history. So let's get started by talking about the lost and found. Now that person in the picture is John Watson, who's the founder of behaviorism but he systematically burned all of his letters, manuscripts, and research notes before he died. He wanted all of his research to die with him, actually. That data is now lost forever. On the other hand, Ebbinghaus, uh, his papers uh, were found 75 years after he died, and Fechner, his diary was found decades after his death, too. Along the same lines, Charles Darwin, had a large number of notebooks and personal letters made available in 1990, which is a century after his death. So the real question would be, how do these discoveries and losses change our view of history? Continuing with what really happened, let's talk about altered and hidden history. Freud was a lifelong cocaine user, but that was minimized by his early biographers. Similarly, Jung had an edited autobiography. His autobiography was actually written by an assistant who left out a lot of things, like the fact that Jung had sexual relations with many, if not most, of his early clients and students. 
Wolfgang Kohler, who was a Gestalt psychologist, may have been a German spy during World War I. He had a research facility in the Canary Islands. He was studying chimpanzees. And it seems like it was a front. Uh, he was actually spying. Well, he did the research, but it was also, he was also a spy. Uh, he was spying on Allied shipping, and he had a hidden radio transmitter in his house. Lost in translation, this idea of Freud and free association. Now, the term free association implies a link between one idea and another, where each acts as a prompt for the next one in a chain. Freud's actual term in German was Einfall. I don't mean to shout, I was shouting in German. Uh, which doesn't mean association. It literally means intrusion or invasion. So Freud meant that the unconscious mind uncontrollably intrudes into conscious thought. And so that's a very different view of free association than we have as English speakers. Putting history in context, uh, the zeitgeist, when we study the history of psychology, we also need to understand the intellectual climate or zeitgeist in which it developed. And sometimes zeitgeist is also translated as the spirit of the times, another German word which I'm shouting. So how about jobs? Well, in 1900, there were three times more psychologists with PhDs than academic positions for them. Now, fortunately, there were a number of growing universities in the West and Midwest, and that picked up the slack. Uh, and so psychology became a uh, mainstream science. School enrollments also increased. So public education became a growth industry for psychology. Public school enrollments uh, were up 700% between 1890 and 1918. Uh, and high schools were being built at a rate of one per day. So psychologists like John Dewey focused on applying psychology to the schools. And that was beneficial for psychology. How about wars? Well, let's start by talking about Freud again. Prior to World War I, Freud had proposed the libido as the primary motivational force in personality. But with World War I, he had to account for people doing things like charging machine guns and destroying things. So he proposed the idea of thanatos, or a desire to destroy, sometimes translated as a death instinct, as another motivational construct. Psychological testing. During World War I, the U.S. Army initiated the first mass intelligence testing of recruits through the Army Alpha and Beta tests, which really boosted the reputation of psychology and psychological testing. Finally, the Gestalt psychologists. With the, with the rise of Hitler in Germany, a number of Gestalt psychologists left Germany and emigrated to the United States. Let's talk about discrimination against women and discrimination based on ethnic origin. Now, for many years, the only academic jobs available to women were at women's colleges, and they were also discriminated against in graduate admissions. Now, in 1906, 12% of the psychologists listed in American Men of Science, note the title, uh, were actually women. And in fact, Mary Witten Calkins was the president of the American Psychological Association in 1905, the year before that was published. To put this in a modern context, though, more than 75% of all new PhDs in psychology are now women. And so there's a, there's a lot of progress that's been made. Discrimination based on ethnic origin. Well into the 1960s, Jewish students faced admission quotas in both colleges and graduate schools. Abraham Maslow was urged by his graduate professors to change his first name to help him get an academic job, but he refused to do so. African Americans have faced an incredible level of prejudice in higher education. Higher education. Francis Sumner, who was the first African American to earn a PhD in psychology in 1920, had to eat at his own separate dining table at Clark University. And this wasn't in the Jim Crow South, but was in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, the other note about Sumner is uh, he was actually, he started college at 15, uh, and he would have finished his PhD earlier if he hadn't been drafted to serve in World War I. He eventually spent most of his career teaching and doing research at Howard University. 
Finally, let's talk about Mamie Phillips Clark and Kenneth Clark. They were a married couple. Uh, they, actually, that's their picture there. Uh, they both had PhDs and they faced constant obstacles in getting into graduate school and getting appropriate jobs in higher education. Their research on racial identity was cited in the famous 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case that uh, ended racial segregation in public schools. Also, Kenneth Clark was the president of the American Psychological Association in 1971. Let's talk about the conceptions of scientific history. And basically, there's two schools of thought on this. The personalistic theory of scientific history focuses on the achievements and contributions of specific individuals. So according to this view, progress and change are attributed to unique and charismatic individuals. So people like Darwin, Einstein, and Steve Jobs change the times. A good question to ask about this, that's Steve Jobs, by the way, when he was young, is would products like the iPod and the iPhone, so basically MP3 players and smartphones, have been invented without Steve Jobs? Or would they have been invented anyway? The naturalistic theory of scientific history uh, is, stresses the importance of zeitgeist. And it says that it's the times that make the progress. So if Darwin had died young, uh, according to the naturalistic theory, somebody else would have come up with natural selection because it fit the spirit of the times. Support for this comes with the idea that uh, there's simultaneous discoveries of a number of different things in science and technology. And this happens all the time. It includes things like the discovery of calculus, oxygen, logarithms, sunspots, color photography, and the typewriter. You can also see the influence of zeitgeist in the subject matter. Uh, so the subject matter of psychology, for example, uh, the study of consciousness. Now that's what gets the field started, and then it falls out of favor for about 50 years and then it comes roaring back with cognitive psychology and the cognitive revolution. And the same is true for different research methods, which go in and out of fashion depending on the zeitgeist. What about schools of thought? A school of thought refers to a group of psychologists who become associated ideologically and sometimes geographically with the leader of a movement. A good example would be Freud's Wednesday Psycho Psychological Society, which was a group of therapists which, with an interest in psychoanalysis that started meeting in Freud's apartment on the Burgerstrasse in Vienna in 1902. Now, Thomas Kuhn, uh, who's in the picture, he writes about paradigms, which is an accepted way of thinking within a scientific discipline that provides essential questions and their answers. A good example is in physics, where Newton's conception of a mechanistic universe was eventually replaced by Einstein's theory about relativity. Now, the change from one paradigm to another is what Kuhn means by a scientific revolution. And he wrote his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Psychology has not yet reached this paradigmatic stage. Um, there's nothing that everyone in psychology agrees on. Even the accepted definition of psychology, which is the study of the mind and behavior. Well, which one is it? Is it the study of the mind or is it the study of behavior? Uh, well, it's both, but it, there's not agreement. Uh, there's actually 60 different divisions of the American Psychological Association, including one that just focuses on the history of psychology. Now, these divisions aren't really schools of thought. Uh, they're really just focused on different subject matter. But it shows that there really isn't, we're at a pre-paradigmatic uh, stage in psychology. Where there's not something that everyone agrees on yet. And let's finish the first chapter by talking about the entire history of psychology in one paragraph. And this is just an outline of the book. So first we'll talk about the precursors of psychology, then Wundt and the founding of psychology, then the early schools of psychology, structuralism and functionalism, followed by behaviorism, gestalt psychology, psychoanalysis, the humanistic school, and cognitive psychology. And that's chapter one, and thanks for listening.